Hey, welcome to episode 61, Hollywood Breaks. It's good to be with you this morning. We just finished interviewing Kyle Davies um, and his ex listening to his experience about distributors, what's happening in the exhibition space, and really the transition that theaters are going through right now. Clearly there are, is an effect of COVID, but maybe even the behavior pattern of people wanting to go to the theaters. Um, and then of course, I explore my idea a little bit more of our studios holding back do they have a long-term play and a reason why they're not playing so nice when it comes to the exhibitors? So that and many other things, we welcome Kyle Davies and we welcome you to Hollywood Breaks. From the outside, um, it doesn't seem like studios are busy. Are you guys, is it busy at a studio or is it as slow as it appears from the consumer side of like, we're just waiting for stuff to happen? I think it's busy. I think production's ramping up big time. Um, and then I think beyond that, the traditional, I, I assume you're referring to the theatrical side of things. Yeah. <sighs> That's like a question mark right now because so much content's being created because the streaming platforms are like an insatiable demand. Uh, to have content constantly rolling over. So production people are busy because they're making content, whether it ends up in a theater or if it just ends up on platform plus, whatever it might be. Um, and in terms of the traditional theatrical marketing and distribution people, I think they're, they're, they're busy, but I think there's still a lot of uncertainty. You know, at any given moment, a movie that you think is destined for theaters and you're working on that and you know the big machinery that goes with launching that you know at any given moment that could be like never mind we're going straight oh, to wow. the <clears throat> um, so that's just busy work then like people are busy but it doesn't always come to fruition I, I think what happened a lot during covid is that things would you, you you have to get that machine geared up toward a certain date in marketing and distribution and then with covid really that's, you know, they kept kicking the can on certain dates. There's no way to avoid that. So you have to just, you know, okay, well, we'll, we'll start now on the next date. So it feels, here's what it feels like. Obviously, I think the lesson we've all learned in the past two years is things change, yeah. you know, easily, quickly, expect the unexpected. I think what people are kind of hoping is that COVID keeps becoming a thing in our rear view mirror in the past. And I say that with all the disclaimers, because I think, you know, I think I read yesterday where there was, they've identified some new variant in the UK and it's like, hey, yeah. but who knows? Um, but, but let's assume. And or at least our reaction to that, COVID. COVID might be here forever, yeah. but at least our constant reaction yeah. to it might change. Yeah. yeah, more manageable. So, you know, let's, let's assume it's, it's become something we live with and can manage and, there's a stability uh, in the theatrical world. And, you know, I think the big thing you got now is to get people more comfortable going back to cinemas. Um, you know, consumer behavior, I think, has been changed so much in the past. It was being changed anyway before COVID hit because of streaming. Uh, this flood of content at your fingertips when you wanted it with no commercials, high quality, big production, like that was putting pressure on theatrical and studio, how studios treat content before COVID, before we ever knew what COVID was. But obviously when the past year and a half, people were kind of in this cocoon of staying home and, you know, and I guess that's one of my concerns is, is you know, you get people out of that that weekly, you know, weekend after weekend of at least considering going you know. to the movie. I think that was a question people would ask themselves. What do you want to do this weekend? What's playing at the movies? Um, have we have we kind of trained people for a year and a half to that that question keeps going down on the on the ranking? Oh, oh, it's. It's so interesting. I know Dune's coming out. So I, someone was telling me yesterday that they're actually taking time off from work to go see Dune, which I thought was quite the adventure. That's a great sign. <laughs> pretty sure it's yeah. going to be there after work too. Um, <laughs> and then I asked her, have you been to the theater recently? Nope. It's been, you know, since the pandemic or whatever. 
Um, I even think Connor, Connor that works with us, uh, he recently went to the theater to see, um, uh, I think James Bond or something like that, but it was the first time in a while. So it is, maybe people are getting back, but definitely out of the habit of it. Um, and it's yeah. a, it's kind of interesting just as an industry to have a one-time platform that fed the other platforms. And now it's a total byproduct of of the entertainment world to like, no, the first place I go is the television set. The second place I go is to a theater. Yeah. And it's, you know, is that the way it is forever? Will that change? Will things kind of maybe not go back to the way they were where theatrical was the, the engine that drove everything? Is there a way for both streaming and theatrical to flourish and be successful? And I think that's what, I'm not sure anybody has the answer to that. Um, it's interesting, like Venom was huge, Bond was big. I think Dune, even though it is day and date on HBO, I, I don't know, I mean, it opens today, so we'll see, you'll, you'll know right. Monday. But I think it will, from what I'm hearing, I think it's gonna be successful, but it's also the kind of movie you want to see in a theater. It's visual effects and it's this epic spectacle. But the question for me is, you know, can exhibition theaters survive if they're in a world where the only thing that is working are these tent poles? And admittedly, tent poles are the majority of their business, but there's a big segment, you know, if, if it's 75% of their business, you know, can they survive and flourish with That's that our tent. question to you, Kyle. You're not supposed to have that question. Yeah. We're the ones. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm full yeah. of questions. I don't know how many answers. I have. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's that's spot on because that's sort of what we've been talking about over and over again. Is what does the future look like? And my concern, as yes, I'm a fan of the big, huge tent poles, but my concern is there are also a lot of smaller movies that are great that what if this becomes the model may just get lost like you think of what netflix does where they just throw count of a movie out a week and you get a trailer and a tile and then okay what's next and right. so many things just get lost in that wash and that's my big worry is that if we if like the the thing that i find concerning about the last few weeks yes venom did well bond is doing well halloween kills did well which was day and date and now we have Dune, which looks like it's going to do well. But those are all big titles. Mm -hmm. And I worry that the first title that doesn't have that huge machine behind it, that mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily open huge, then we're going to be back to the whole like, oh, well, theaters aren't going to open. I mean, this isn't going to work. We got to go day and date. So I worry about the smaller films that still need to be seen in the theater, but might not necessarily get the the attention they deserve because of sort of this idea that only a tent pole is really the way to make the money. Yeah. And I share your concern and I, I, I don't have the answer. I mean, I think right now there's several things happening. One, the, the movies, okay, let's just talk about non tent poles. I mean, Halloween is kind of a tent pole within the horror realm. Yeah. And I think horror films are still something people want to see with other people you know, that shared jumping out yep. of your chair and it's like a roller yep. coaster ride. Um, but there's, you know, just movies, whether they're romantic comedy or raunchy comedy or, you know, more specialty things that appeal to adults. First of all, there's a lot of that content online. Older audiences, I think, have been reluctant to go back to the theater just for COVID concerns. Like I mentioned earlier, getting out of that, that muscle memory of every weekend, like at least considering you want to go to the movies. So I think there is some damage done or, you know, it's nobody's fault. It's just the world we live in. But to try and recover those, I think it's going to take some time. I share your concern. I think about some movies. There, there's always movies that, that were non-tent poles that overperformed, that were surprises, you know, and I think about when, when I was at Paramount, we had a quiet place, which, you know, mm -hmm. kind of an unusual uh, riff on the horror thing, you know, not a lot of dialogue. Uh, John Krasinski was a 
a TV star. I mean, now he's a huge star, but you know, he wasn't really like a massive movie star, never directed, or if he maybe only directed one other thing, but yeah, you know, so I, and it, it obviously turned out to be a huge hit and became a franchise for Paramount and it's great. I asked myself like in, in today's world, if that movie came up, whether at any studio, a movie like that, would they take the risk to, you know, look, it, it's not only the cost to produce movies, it's the cost to market and distribute movies. That, it's still very expensive. So, yeah. And like, it, do you wonder it, if the, the success is based on the timing that there was nothing else right. happening and it was a great film and you had to be in the theaters to really appreciate the silence part of it, right? So it's a franchise that came out of COVID that you wonder in the usual marketplace of the noise and the and the signals if you would have even recognized it would have ever drawn your attention. I, just, I think the thing is there's there's movies now that now you've got this this suction of a of a streaming platform that constantly needs to be fed. You've got a movie that's not a tentpole proposition necessarily. It may be really good but it, it's not a tentpole proposition. So there is inherent risk when you say, I'm going theatrically and I'm gonna spend a lot of money to market and distribute this movie. You know, I'm not so sure nowadays movies like that. I mean, even think going back quite a bit, The Hangover, would if, if The Hangover was made now. Yeah. Would you green light it? Right. Yeah. Would they go in- Bridesmaids. <clears throat> Bridesmaids, an R-rated right, yeah. <laughs> female comedy. Right, well, that would probably not get made. Studio, the same studio, whatever studio would make that. Sorry about the barking dogs. Um, you know, would there be? It's it, look, we're going to spend fifty million to market and distribute, or boy, our platform really needs something. Let's just do that. And so that that part scares me because that non tent pole category has always ended up with some overperforming movies in every genre. And I hate to see a world where we don't have that anymore. You know, I I, I would want to I do want to ask you, Kyle, because you brought up a very interesting point. Because the one of the last movies I worked on at Fox was Morgan, which was a smaller sort of horror-ish type film. It was um, directed by um, um, Ridley Scott's son. Ridley Scott produced it, and there was this constant question about when we were going to release it, and it just kept being pushed and pushed and pushed and. So we'd start working on the materials and then we'd stop working on the materials and we'd start working on materials and we'd stop working on materials. So, you know, obviously as you can imagine the bills just kept piling up and piling up because you're stopping and starting and stopping and starting. And then we switched to the way things are now. And, you know, you look at what Disney did with their restructure, which was supposed to make sense. And I don't think anybody's really figured it out yet was sort of Kareem Daniels group sort of taking over the distribution angle and their head of distribution now reports into him versus reporting into Alan Bergman, which is, I think, a huge shift, which I don't think really got the attention it deserved. But I wonder about whether or not you think that's the future. If that's, you know, because it seems like you're, you know, at Viacom now, with Brian Robbins in charge at Paramount, it seems like they might be moving to that model a little bit too, where, you know, you kind of look at all the platforms and figure out where it's going to, you know, play best. So do you think that's sort of the future where now there's going to be one person who's not really housed in creative or even in marketing for that matter. And he, that he or she is going to be the one and his team are going to be the one that's going to make the decision where it ultimately ends up. Do you think that's the future or do you think it's still sort of an experiment? <clears throat> I, I think it's a, it is an experiment, but I actually, if I had to bet, I think it is the future. I think uh, having a powerful streaming platform with subscribers is just as important to the, the studios as having success in the more, you know, traditional theatrical world. And, you know, it, it'll be interesting because I think you, you want someone who is well versed in both worlds. Not a lot of people, you know, you know have been in both worlds. But um, I think it can work out if if they both truly have the the desire and they think it's important for there to be success in both theatrical and streaming. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it does seem like that's the future where you're going to have one person overseeing that whole funnel. I think the first test is going to be Ghostbusters Afterlife because it's not, mm -hmm. you know, it's not Top Gun or, or Bond where it's an absolute throwback. It's a kind of a new genre or a new film, new storyline. Um, and it's not a huge kind of blockbuster based off of a video game or some other um, previous, you know, gigantic cast or something like that. So with that one coming out, I think is the one where we're going to say, is this going to survive? Are we going to be able to do, you know, like you say, the hangover type of movies where it has a niche audience or only adult audience and keep, keep the industry going. I'm also curious if the exhibitors are going to start, you know, changing the layout of their, of their theaters. Are we going to stop doing 19 theaters and just do one or two? better side-by-side, -side, better service, and be able to handle one for the blockbusters and one for the smaller venues? Um, I think exhibition, they're obviously in a real crossroads here. Um, I think there'll be, you know, the, a, lot of, a lot of circuits got, you know, uh, assist, like a lot of businesses got assistance from the government to ride this out. So I think there's, they have a period of time going into next year to kind of recover, let's say. What will they do? I mean, look, the financial model of, of exhibition is, is really based on a certain number of patrons going into their buildings. So that's under pressure because you're seeing windows compress, which can cannibalize attendance. You're seeing, like for the reasons we discussed, the pressure of streaming, maybe fewer movies. You're seeing pressure that you know, like we said, that non tent pole category or people do they even care about going to the theater. So there's a lot of downward pressure on them. But to answer your question, I think they're going to have and, and they were they were doing it anyway. They yeah, were, they were struggling to begin with. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. but they were also trying to make the theater a real an experience that you couldn't get at home. Recline, you know, big oh, yeah. chairs, the big screen, you know, whether it was IMAX or their own you know, branded kind of big screen experience, a lot of, you know, bars, restaurants. Yeah, food service in it now. Food yeah. service, yeah. And um, so I think they're going to continue to do that. Um, you know, it's it's not so easy if you if you have an existing theater with an existing foot physical footprint, you know, to repurpose that. It's like very expensive to, you know, so um but I think they're going to continue to try and up, make upgrades. Um, you know, you, you'll probably see towards the latter part of next year, the, the, you know, the strong survive and the ones that just can't, maybe they won't. So, yeah. but I think that whole, you know, I think a lot of people predicted demise within exhibition. I think that that's been put off for a while. Um, We're going to have to dig up those old movie theaters. Get them back from the churches and the diamond <laughs> and jewelry exchanges or whatever they're inside of them and yeah. take them back. Like, hey, we need this one big building for one event only. We don't need yeah. all these uh, multiplexes. Yeah, one of the questions I have, and and I'm I just not expecting an answer, but I, I put it out there because it's something I think about. Was is, you know, for us because we're older, you know, going to the theater for me is still special. But that's what I grew up on, you know, mm -hmm. seeing a movie that way to me is much more desirable than seeing it on television. Even if I have a big screen TV, I'm laying down, I'm going to fall asleep. Someone's going to pause it. it. The sound's not, it's just not the same to me. The question I have is, you know, younger people in their teens and twenties, do they care? Like is watching it on their phone or their, their iPad or in home to them, since maybe they, they grew up on cell phones, like is watching content to them that way, just as satisfying and meaningful and, and seeing it at the theater. Like, I don't know where that ranks. Sure. I, you know, that's something that kind it of- It does seem that way, out. doesn't it? Like, I, I, I don't want to age myself too much, but we had a black and white TV. You know what I mean? Like, and we didn't measure it in inches. I don't know if they ever said like how many inches our TV were. It's like, it's just the TV that you have, right? And you're right, you're talking about a generation or even two generations of people, I feel like, have had the benefit of a large format and better sound system just at home. And that's kind of been the competition, your home entertainment space and the, 
and the exhibit entertainment space. Yeah, um, I mean, it's but the yeah, like if you break the habit from everyone else, like it doesn't. Yeah, you know, why go? It's, it's interesting. I'm 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 teaching a, a film class online, and and so what are they all? They're twenty, give or take a year, and <laughs> I realized just in discussing with them, like they've never really lived in a world where you let's talk about television where you would oh there's a show i love and it's on tuesday night at yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no 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 what been viewing is not in their in their repertoire <laughs> and so those are the things i'll tell you another question i know i'm supposed to answer things and i'm throwing no no it. this is great like, no, that's no, good this like, is a conversation i love it filmmakers right so young aspiring filmmakers whether you're a director or a, you want to be a director of photography or cinematographer or screenwriter, whatever. Like, I wonder if I was, you know, back, if I could go back in time and I, I didn't follow that route, but if I did anything creatively that I wanted to make in my mind, I think I would always assume it's going to be in a theater on the big screen. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, it's cur I'm curious, like if you're a cinematographer, a young cinematographer in your mind are you making it for the big screen or is that irrelevant to you and kyle well, just take your like, the science is out of that profession even right like just think realize all the science that went into from the physics of of putting a reel into a camera and knowing that you only have so many feet of film before it runs out so you're doing something around the physical aspect of it to all the chemical aspect of it the lighting aspect of it and uh, I was on a shoot recently and it was some little handheld thing with a, with a secondary monitor <laughs> and the cinematographer, basically the person holding the camera, like they didn't have to do anything. They, no matter what the lighting was, it worked. Um, right. They were trying to do some kind of weird visual effect outside at night without any lights, the camera picked it up. So like what? it is like the, the change of what the exhibition is going to be um, is probably related to the effort you have to put into it. If you don't have to put that much effort into it, do you, I don't know, you well, just TikTok it, it enough, right? It's Well, it's funny because Apple now with their iPhones, I don't know if you guys have seen the latest Apple oh, yeah. 13 commercials. It's all shooting movies on an iPhone. Like right. that's what they're doing. So to them, you know, to your class, I think a lot of it is like, oh, all I have to do is take my iPhone and just point it and then add some sort of visual effect which I think is a detriment. And I think that's a lack of understanding in a lot of ways on the art of setting up a shot. You know, if you've never been on set, um, especially in a big complicated movie, you don't understand like the intricacies of setting up a shot. So when I worked on Val, uh, Van Helsing, I was fortunate enough to watch Alan Davio at work who worked with Spielberg for, um, Empire of the Sun, which anyone who hasn't seen that movie needs to see it. It's a yeah, beautifully gorgeous. shot movie. And, you know, watching him work is really like watching an artist because they work with the lighting and he's walking around with his lens. And it's just, it really, I think there's a sense that you've lost sort of the artistic skill that goes into making a movie. And I think we kind of have to kind of go back to that a little bit. And to your order earlier, I mean, I'm all about sort of thinking about my, you know, to your point about thinking about your childhood. Like I remember standing in line at my hometown theater to go see Batman with Tim, uh, with Michael Keaton. And that was like a, a seminal moment in my childhood. The first movie I went to see by myself because I really wanted to see it was Jurassic Park. And I remember sitting there watching that brontosaurus walk across the screen with my mouth open. And I'm like, yeah. is this real? How did they right. do this? Yeah. And then History, the how moment, they did it. one moment, the moment when I was sitting there watching Titanic and the film, the theater was crowded and the ship breaks apart and you could have heard a pin drop in that theater because everyone was just in awe. Mm -hmm. And like, I really think that the younger generation just doesn't know any of that. Um, and I think if there's a way to reintroduce them to that, like I was watching the ambulance trailer today and it's classic Michael Bay, the slow motion shots, the helicopter slowly behind the ambulance, tight shots of his gorgeous, you know, really good looking yeah. cast. But it's like, okay, that's great. But I think, and it's all like flutter cut it and it's quick. And it's, I mean, I just think 
maybe Dune may be a, somewhat of a reset in terms of a, an opportunity for to show the scale of what is possible yeah. when you actually put an actual craft into it versus just trying to shoot it on your iPhone. Yeah. I, I think so maybe the, yeah. that's a possibility. I, I don't know. I think, I think at the end of the day, there's a lot of uncertainty, but if we can keep getting, let's, let's put windows aside. And I know exhibition, obviously <laughs> that's important. And, and I get that they need some exclusivity or what's the point, but the more content we can keep getting into theaters and hopefully it's supported by marketing because you can put the greatest movie in the world in the theaters, but if there's no marketing support, no one knows. But the yeah. more we, we try and get this muscle memory back of going to the theaters. Look, I like watching stuff at home. I watched Succession the other night oh, and I, great. <laughs> I loved it. You know, I can't wait for next week or whenever the next one comes on. So I'm not saying theatrical is great and everything else is not i don't there's there's but i hope there's enough content to keep theaters going because there's when you go to the theater and the lights go down and you you are not to sound sappy here but you at least for me i do feel that kind of transport where you kind of are in this uh moment where it's a sensory deprivation the screen opens. Yeah, everything yeah. on that screen and nothing, nothing. I don't care what any, I don't care how good your TV is at home. Nothing can replicate that big screen and the sound yeah. and a great story. It doesn't have to be special effects. I mean, remember when you saw the hangover or whatever that comedy super bad i mean it, it's just it's great you know yeah. and yeah i think uh, i'm gonna miss the laughter of a group of people because there's right, just something gonna, about being in the yeah. theater where that moment comes in we all jump and then some right. we all kind of giggle like holy crap that was kind of scary or those big seeing, um, yeah um, i remember um, seeing traffic know, thunder yeah. and i was just like i was I had cramps. I was laughing so hard. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Jackass was something that was on TV, but right. I can't wait to go see it because I want to go with my my sons and we yep. have a blast. And so We're also kind of missing the pop culture part of it where, you know, the because of certain windows, we all related to content at certain times, right? Where, um, you know, right now, Squid Games might be have that relevance because it's done enough in the pop culture mindset that, and enough people are consuming it at one time to kind of get a sense that there is a, a, we can have a conversation around that moment. But so many pieces of content are watched out of order. I might be in the middle of Ted Lasso and Keith's not going to watch it for two years. Um, and it will just be as relevant two years from now as it is for Keith that it is for me now, but we don't get to share it together. So I think there is a cultural shift taking place that way. And the demand to be in pop culture that way is, um, is almost going away. Therefore, the demand to get to the exhibitor, watch it together, grab your friends and, and get to the moment ahead of time. I don't know that standing in line, blockbuster uh, moments, like yeah. I think it's gone. Yeah, I the think water. there's something new to come and it's there's filmmakers going to discover something yeah. new or we'll again, like the exhibitors will build different kinds of buildings and we'll see an evolution of something completely yeah. different. And it's, it's, it's kind of, to me, it's the good news, bad news, which is the good news is there's a, a tidal wave of content, which is great. Um, it's also like, it's almost overwhelming and you can't see everything. And like you say, it is so now so all over the place. There aren't those water cooler conversations that we had about, oh, did you see this movie this week? And oh, it's great. Um, that's not happening but with all the content out there i have to hope that you know some of it will get a shot theatrically and th the truth of the matter is the public decides if you have something that's really good people will figure it out and they will go and it can become well in a way like i think a franchise. quiet place figured yeah. it out like there is something to yeah. me that says maybe it's luck but also I think they kind of figured it out like, oh, this, this is the new movie going experience. So there's a genre now that's going to fit into that. And then of course, if that makes money, then that genre is going to be promoted more and exhibitors are going to change their exhibition to match that kind of uh, yeah. approach as well. I would also say that the one thing Hollywood has traditionally been great at, and, and they still are, is creating events, events out of content, you know, 
the to create buzz and urgency on oh you gotta go see this movie this weekend which that that feeling I feel is somewhat lost in streaming because it is such a it's like this supernova pulse of light and it's gone and it's on to the next thing that's just the nature of streaming but Hollywood's really Hollywood marketing is really great at uh, creating an event about you got to go see this thing and if the movie's good then it kind of can blow up and suddenly become a franchise that that that's very valuable to the studios the creation of the so when you talk to the exhibitors now what's the most common thing you hear concern about windows okay meaning uh, that competing with uh, ott and their exhibit so the day and date thing i'm sure they're just hating the hell out of that right so the windows like the, the traditional window was i think pre-COVID was probably 72 days from theatrical premiere to some sort of digital transaction. And now that that's changed, obviously. So you have HBO and then like Halloween's an example. I think uh, Paramount did it on Paw Patrol where it's day and day. You can, yeah. there is no exclusive. And the studio doesn't necessarily care about that because the, the exhibition window they don't make money off of that. That's not a, that's not a corporation. They have to split with own. the exhibitors too. That's the they, other thing. They it's a revenue money. share. They make money yeah. and it used to be the engine that if you had success theatrically, that kind of, that was helpful to all the ancillaries down the line. But yeah. with the, with COVID, because theaters were shut down. So you've had windows shortened. So now it's a variety. There's day and date. There's 17 days kind of seems to be a thing for certain kind of smaller movie, non-tent pole, let's say. 17 and days. 17 days. So that's three weekends, which wow. actually, you know, most of your business is done by then. Yeah, and, I guess you know, right. And, and there were always, before any of this happened, you know, there were always studies I would see where they would ask consumers, do you know what the window or how many days a movie is in theaters before it's available in the home? And the answers were all over the map because I just don't think consumers really were aware of it. So whether 17 days is good or bad, I, you know, we'll see, but you're kind of seeing instead of 72 days, the norm, the new norm seems to be 30 to 45 days. Like that's like, okay, good. That's a good window. 17 days seems like for a non tent pole that's livable, but there are, you know, uh, there are day and date situations. I think, well, Black Widow was, you could see it for a premium VOD if you had Disney plus. So that it's, it's a, it's a grab bag right now, but I think they're hopeful that next year, there's some, a little more stabilization that the day and dates aren't so frequent that the set, that the ones that have 17 days, maybe go to 30 days. That's their hope. I don't know. I don't so know. You, what... and you're, so you don't have a sense that the exhibitors are um, embracing this and pivoting to something new. There's almost a wishful thinking that it could return. I think so, because I think yeah. they certainly have had no choice. I mean, those buildings are built for one thing, and that's to see movies. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this, this COVID kind of accelerated. There was always pressure to shorten the windows, but I think it, it just kind of became a, a big uh, collision so we're here you know shortened windows are here to stay I, my sense is it'll stabilize and hopefully there are more windows or you know movies with windows whether it's 17 or 30 or 45 but i still think you're going to see day and date scenarios I don't have you guys had this phenomenon where i <clears throat> where i feel like the movie theaters are being spread out more let me say this again like the it feels like half of the theaters are shutting so the distance between theaters that are open are, have a greater distance to them um so locally um, like yeah. we have one there was a couple now there's one standing so the next one is another 25 miles from where i am but even in orange county i was noticing some of those shouldn't be you know 80s buildings that are still what were still open are now shuttered and it's maybe between shopping mall and shopping mall so the distance seems to double between them yeah i mean it's not some have shut down obviously if you live in los angeles that you know pacific and arc light was kind of a big deal um regal closed their theaters for a while but they've reopened so 
there have been some closures, not as not a horrible amount. So I think to answer your question, their, their exhibitors are concerned about windows. I think their other concern that kind of the thing that sticks in their craw is when you see suddenly a movie gets, oh, they sold it to Netflix or they sold it to Amazon like that. Yeah. They're like, ah, cause that's, they need that flow of product. And, you know, that gets nibbled away by a bit. That's, that's, you know, movies equal patrons in their building. And that's what their financial model is built upon. How many people in my theater can I but expect and forecast to come in in a certain amount of time because a body in a building equals a ticket sale. And I know how much that is and it equals concession sales. And I know on average what that is. Yeah. I still have a, a little bit of uh, this thing in the back of my mind that the studios are kind of bullying the exhibitors like the, with the paramount decree falling, I swear, like some of these studios know, like if we beat them up enough, eventually we can buy out a theater chain yeah. and they are holding things back and not playing nice because there's an interesting business proposition out there. And if the Paramount decree was still in place. I wouldn't have that thought, but clearly somebody got that passed in the, in the middle of the night, you know, with Congress um, last year during yeah, the pandemic. I, and there's this I, other thing, yeah. like I mean, there's an opportunity if, if they, if they hold I'm on. not sure. I, I'm not sure. I think it's that conspiratorial. I think like we'll my, have to put some money on this. Yeah. That's fine, <laughs> but I, yeah. Look, running, running theater changes is, is, is hard work. And I'm not sure the theater uh, studios, like they got enough challenges. Um, I think that Paramount decrees came from, you know, a long time ago in history, but agree to disagree but i think i yeah, think sure. it's really i think it's really not them wanting to bully theaters i just think it's it is content is consumed at you know on demand commercial free with subscription now it's the, it's this it's really most of this is just the impact of streaming is my opinion yeah sure no um, it's and, definitely and I, I hope it's not binary where it's like well you can either have a successful streaming platform if you're a studio or you can have theatrical and you must pick one i hope that's not the case i hope over the next year we that i say we the the industry figures out a way for both to be successful because they're both great ways to consume content well could so maybe you can help out keith um when you talk to your exhibitor friends can you have them clean up the old popcorn? Because the one thing that keep <laughs> talking about is the smell of stale popcorn. And I went to to watch uh, James Bond, and I smelled if I like I never had that experience. And Keith has put that in my brain, and now I smell the stale popcorn when I walk in the movie theater. So would you mind just to sorry ask to... do what I can do? <laughs> I had a I I went and had a a Mr. Pib and popcorn when i dumped my peanut m ms in the popcorn i was in in heaven oh, it's so great yeah. oh that's a good combo nice it's i like hard that. To, to shove it into your mouth without looking yeah that, that slows you down a little bit i'm a red vines <laughs> and popcorn <laughs> guy myself i am a cherry coke red vines and popcorn person oh, and i like that's half a lot a red of cherry vine and a handful of popcorn <laughs> in my mouth it tastes like a popcorn ball from my from my jaw <laughs> i like it. I that's a, actually, we should run a survey. What is your theater food? I'm being curious. Yeah. Food. yeah. Does yeah, anybody do hot dogs anymore? Is that even like a thing? It's like, still a thing. nachos. Who does nachos at a theater? That's ridiculous. I, uh, that's more baseball game for me. Me yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. Savory. Yeah. No, you gotta be. Yeah. yeah. You gotta be sweet when you're sitting in a theater. Yeah. It's gotta it's got be. And, and this much popcorn, more popcorn yes. than you'd ever eat anywhere else. You're going to always consume. order more than container. <laughs> Let them upsell you. You know, you're going to eat it. Come, come on. on. Right. <laughs> they always say you can come back for a refill. Okay. After I've eaten like seven after pounds, I, eat this, I like need that. another seven pounds. <laughs> yeah. I, I've never, uh, I always go for the upsell. It's it yeah. pays off in the long run. So. That's right. That's how you're paying for your movie. It's not the ticket yeah, up front. Exactly. That's how the yeah. But now you got me all excited. I want to go to the movies right now. So. <laughs> there you go. See, I know. Right. Now I'm hungry. Doing Dune's job. out. Let's go see Dune and watch. <laughs> eat some popcorn. I, hey, my 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 kids are all already bought their 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 tickets to go see Dune tomorrow. 
Nice. Um, I still haven't seen Bond. I need to get that. Oh, no, it's out. good. Yeah. What's your uh, hey, hey Kyle? What's your theater where you're? What, what theater are you closest to in LA? I'm. Pr- I was going to ArcLight Hollywood, which I can't do for uh, obvious reasons. I, I go yeah. to the Grove. Um, oh, the Grove's still open. Oh yeah, AMC oh. reopened that. Oh, nice. That yeah. was my go-to when I, because I used to live like right across the street. And I would do. That's why I just walk and watch movies yeah. all afternoon. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's it's AMC reopened it and they've done a great job. And oh, that's awesome. That's, yeah, that was a great venue. Convenient. That's a great venue. And, uh, it's a nice theater. So yeah, I got yeah. That's probably where I head the most. Oh, that's great. Well, Kyle, thank you so much for coming back. We appreciate it. We are my pleasure. We're man. still going, so we'll see episode 90 as well. It feels wow. like <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep it up. Ranking. Keep uh keep doing what you can to uh get people to the movies because it's it's awesome. Yeah, we'd love yeah. it. And it's the it's not just the studio and the filmmakers. But the marketers, all the great work and people and kind of fun experiences just to watch the trailers and be part of it. I mean, there's this whole industry is so beautiful and wonderful in so many great ways. So yep. I know it's going through transition. My my biggest kind of um, hope and uh, optimistic thinking is just that whatever this pivot is will be a new evolution that gives opportunity to something new. And it's, some of the old survived, gatekeepers go away and new gatekeepers it, show up, but yeah, for sure. It's survived a lot of, uh, changes and, and, uh, challenges over, over its history. So, yeah, yeah, it's fun. Well, we appreciate you joining us again. All right. And I Thank have you. to thank Lydia is not on camera, but I thank Lydia for pulling this together and Connor for helping us make this uh, show too. It's great having you guys there, Michelle and the Go Social team, the people that do things afterwards. We appreciate you. If you love what you hear, make sure you reach out to Kyle. Kyle is on LinkedIn. I know that because that's where we promote him and talk about him. So if you have any opinions directly, just give it to Kyle. Make him face his own <laughs> <laughs> shoes. Um, but we're available. We'd love to hear from you. So thanks for watching. And Kyle, we'll, again, we'll see you again soon. You got it. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs>